Welcome to chapter five. Uh, here we're going to talk a bit about stem cells and their role in development. One of the key aspects of stem cells is this notion that it can make more stem cells. Uh, so here we see that this stem cell is just pl uh, proliferating and making more stem cells. And it, these stem cells can also then commit and differentiate and become other types of tissues. Um, and so this process is called asymmetrical or asymmetric uh, cell division. And so um, they're able to continue keeping up their numbers through this production of just more stem cells, but those stem cells can then go on and replenish uh, other tissues that need differentiation, uh, such as um, to become bone tissue or um, muscle tissue, etc. And so this is what also makes stem cells very um, uh, desirable in the medical industry because um, if you take stem cells, you can make a whole bunch of them because they're able to undergo this reproductive uh, stage where they just create more of themselves. But then through different uh, treatments with hormones and other morphogens, you can have them differentiate into um, theoretically any different type of tissue that you desire. In addition to single cell uh, asymmetry, which we saw before, um, you can have population asymmetry or symmetrical differentiation. And so this is where a single stem cell divides and the product of that division, the two daughter cells, uh, they can either divide to produce two stem cells. So both daughter cells become stem cells or they can divide and produce two committed cells. So a cell that's gonna become a specific tissue type. Now, when we think of this from a population standpoint, um, if this cell were to divide and become more stem cells uh, to the left here, then we've increased the population of stem cells in that area by one. Now, if it were to divide and both of those cells, the daughter cells become uh, committed cells, then we've decreased the population of those stem cells by one. And so that's why it's uh, population asymmetry. So it's, it's not the same uh, between the beginning and end results. In many uh, different organ or tissue types, um, cell, stem cell lineages pass from multipotent stem cells, so over here on the left, um, which are a multipotent is a stem cell that is able to form a whole bunch of different types of tissues. From there, they pass to committed stem cells. Um, these committed stem cells, as we talked about commitment earlier, they are on their way to becoming a tissue type. They're kind of that intermediate uh, stage, and they can become usually one or a few um, types of different tissues, not as many as the multipotent. Uh, From there, they progress to become these progenitor cells, also called transit amplifying cells. And these are cells that are pretty committed to becoming a certain tissue. So in this case, uh, these are kind of two different types of uh, uh, nervous system cells, um, but they kind of increase the numbers of the cells in that tissue. So what they can do is they can amplify themselves over and over and over again, and they're called, they're transient. So that means that these progenitor cells don't stay around forever, but while they are around, they uh, amplify multiple times to create a lot of these progenitor stem cells that then can differentiate to become this finalized version. So from this, if we look at this as a, a, a kind of three or four step process, um, we have from multipotent, which is the most flexible, to committed, which is less flexible, to progenitor, which is tissue specific, which can amplify a whole bunch, and then create that one uh, tissue specific uh, type of, of cell. Now let's talk about the different potentials of these cells. So we have our potential, the cell type, and their source. And first we have totipotent. And totipotent cells are capable of producing all cell types of lineages. And so um, this is, includes the fertilized egg and the first four to eight cells. It, they can also form uh, embryonic cells. But on top of that, they can also uh, form the extra embryonic 
extra embryonic cells uh, like the placenta and the yolk sac and things that aren't actually included uh, with the embryo but kind of surrounding the embryo. From there we have pluripotent and we've you've heard this multiple times uh, throughout our, our semesters or quarter so far. Um, these are cells that are capable of producing all the cell types of just the embryo so they can't do the placenta or the yolk sac but all the cells within the embryo um, and when you um, hear about embryonic stem cells, these are these pluripotent stem cells that are capable of producing um, all the rest of, of the cells within the embryo um, and establish uh, these cell lines that stem cell research uses. Um, from there, a little more specified are the multipotent stem cells. Um, these are resident stem cells that are maintained within the developing tissue. Um, and these generate cells specific to the tissue that they reside in. So in our um, example here, we have, uh, we're gonna talk about neurons. And so we have the adult brain. And so these multipotent stem cells are able to produce cells within the brain, within that tissue type, and they can no longer, they're not pluripotent anymore, so they can no longer create muscle tissue or bone or kidney or, or something of like that. From there, we have neuronal uh, progenitor. So these are going to be uh, neurons. And so, for instance, uh, these reside in the brain or spinal cord uh, in this instance. Um, and these can only divide into more neurons on a limited basis. Um, and so, um, again, we have here uh, these uh, neuronal uh, precursors, which are kind of the step beyond the progenitor where they're almost fully differentiated. And again, these will be able to do limited division um, to kind of replace um, uh, cells within the brain that if they're damaged or things of that nature, uh, things that are growing, et cetera. Um, and then from there, we have the fully functional uh, non-myototic neuron. And so these are differentiated cells. So these are you know, neurons and glial cells, et cetera, things from the brain. And they are specific to the brain and they can no longer differentiate in anything else. They can only become more neurons. Another specialized type of stem cell we have are hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells. We'll refer to them as HSCs from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so these HSCs are stem cells that generate blood cells throughout an individual's life. Um, and they're in, for, formed in the bone uh, marrow and divide to form more HSCs. So these um, HSCs can regenerate themselves just like other stem cells. But alternatively, uh, these daughter cells are capable of becoming either lymph node uh, progenitor cells, so up here, um, which can then become these specialized cells within the uh, immune system, such as B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, or uh, natural killer cells, NK cells. Or alternatively, these uh, HSCs can become myeloid progenitor cells, and these are the precursors to a lot of the uh, blood cells, so platelets, red blood cells, uh, macrophages, etc. So there's, they retain a bit of multipotency where they're able to form multiple different types of cells. And the type of cell that they uh, differentiate into is determined by the microenvironment um, that, that those uh, HSCs are experiencing or exposed to. So what are these components of the environment or stem cell niche that uh, help determine, for example, what those red blood, uh, blood cells turn into? Um, there are extracellular mechanisms, so these are things obviously outside of the cell. Um, physical mechanisms such as structural and adhesion factors, so those are the things that are actually physically on the neighboring cells that are touching uh, these cells. There's chemical regulation, and so um, that's these signaling proteins that surround the cell, and that's endocrine, paracrine, or juxtacrine mechanisms. Um, and remember the difference between these are the distance that they travel. So juxtacrine is um, similar to physical mechanisms like adhesion factors, but they're um, those specialized proteins that are able to send messages to cells directly touching them. Paracrine, remember that's local signaling, 10, 15 cell distance. And then endocrine um, is using the endocrine system. So long range hormone signaling using you know, the vasculature of uh, uh, the blood cells or of the uh, blood vessels, et cetera. And then there's also uh, intracellular regulatory mechanisms. Um, so there's determinants within the cytoplasm 
Um, there is transcriptional regulation, so, so genes turning on and off um, and changes in RNA abundance, as well as epigenetic regulation. So these are methylation, histone modifications, things like that, that determine what genes are turned on or off. So this epigenetic regulation uh, kind of is one step above this transcriptional regulation. But these all play roles in determining uh, the niche of that stem cell and what it will eventually turn into. So building off that last slide, uh, this is kind of a, um, a visual depiction of that. And so we have these uh, extracellular mechanisms such as mechanical force and uh, adhesion factors, et cetera. Um, and remember, we have these proteins that span the membrane that then go into the cytoplasm, which can tell the cell, uh, provide information to the cell. Um, we also have paracrine signaling. Remember, this is um, from multiple cells away that these proteins are uh, excreted out into the environment and they can give information to neighboring uh, cells. Uh, we also have uh, a similar to a paracrine um, signaling um, is this neurotransmitter release where um, we have you know, the um, synaptic cleft where molecules are being sent across that cleft to the neighboring cells which can provide information. Um, here in the uh, physical interactions that we talked about, we have uh, cell adhesion. Uh, so these are just those factors that are binding cell tissues together, or cells to become tissues. We have juxtacrine signaling, which were those uh, additionally those uh, proteins that span cell membrane and connect two cells that can provide information from one to the other. And then we have endocrine signaling, which remember this is uh, re relies on the circulatory system and blood vessels to provide these hormones from long way, uh, long range uh, way, whether it be your you know thyroid gland or pituitary gland, etc., um, that can then be uh, released to the cells nearby those blood vessels and provide information to change um, these. Um, the transcription profile of the cell. So then all these different uh, environmental factors or stimuli are taken together and combined with epigenetic regulation, we can change the transcription of genes required for certain cell types. So if all these or external stimuli say you need to become a blood cell, taking all that together, then the genome will just express genes that are required to become a blood cell, and then you have a commitment. So now we're going to look at this, these stem cells kind of more in the early developmental uh, process. So the intercellular mass, uh, abbreviated ICM here, um, is these inner cells within the developing blastocyte. And so I've circled them here. Um, from the development of the morula to the blastocyte, there are three principal cell types. We have the ICM, which I've circled uh, previously here. We have the trophectoderm, which is these outside cells. And then we have the primitive or early development primitive uh, endoderm. In this early blastocyte, this uh, purple ICM that I've circled is about 12 cells big, so it's very early in the development. Um, cultured cells of this ICM can produce embryonic stem cells. So when you hear of these stem cell lines, um, a lot of times they arise from this ICM where they retain their pluripotency and can generate all the cells within the body. And if you look at this kind of holistically, um, at an early stage here, we have you know a couple dozen cells, and these need to become all the cells of the body. So it makes sense that um, these uh, ICM cells in the middle here have the ability to become heart tissue or bone tissue or liver tissue, etc. So how are these ICMs created and relegated to the center of the developing blastocyst? So it all depends on the access of division. And so if the cells divide parallel to the apicobasal axis, then what happens is as it divides, they stay part of this outer layer of cells. So they're just added and you have a trophectoderm expansion 
right? And so they just kind of push those other cells around and they too become these trophectoderm uh, cells. Now, if you have asymmetrical division perpendicular to this apicobasal axis, where the division happens where one cell is kind of pushed to the inside, one of the two daughter cells, and one cell remains in this trophectoderm layer, then you create an ICM cell. And the reason or the way that this is differentiated is how the, within this dividing cell here, how some of these constituents of the cytoplasm are um, relegated to each of the daughter cells. In this example, um, we have these constituents of the cytoplasm or the cell membrane that are divided equally, right? So when this divides, some get the same amount of red here and the same amount of red on this side. In the case of these uh, asymmetrical divisions that are perpendicular to this uh, apicobasal axis, the bottom cell that becomes the ICM would get all of those components, those uh, cyto uh, cytoplasmic components or membrane components, and it would be significantly different from the cell that remains in the trophectoderm. So we'll go into this a little bit more in the coming slides. So let's look at what happens when this cell divides perpendicular to apical basal axis. So here we have the uh, apical side and the basal side. And on the apical side of these cells, we have these two proteins, PAC and APKC. What they do is they bind and repress this cytoplasmic protein called AMOP. Now, when this cell divides perpendicular to that axis, these apical proteins, PAC and APKC, they are not included, they are absent in the daughter cell that is now in the ICM. So what that does is it allows AMOT to go and bind with these E cadherin molecules. And remember, E cadherin molecules are only between cells. And since this is the outer cell layer at the top here, there are no E cadherin molecules. So this ICM cell then can bind the AMOT to the uh, E cadherin. And from there, it calls this kinase cascade, this hippokinase cascade, which goes down and it suppresses uh, YAP and TAS um, and causes changes in transcription and allows these cells to become and proliferate as ICM cells and differentiate from uh, the trophectoderm layer. And so depending on the cell division determines whether or not this cell becomes ICM or uh, is, continues to be this trophectoderm. And so if you imagine all of this um, dividing parallel to the apicobasal axis, you still have PAC and uh, APKC in both the daughter cells. But if you divide perpendicular, then the top cell will have both of those apical proteins and the bottom cell will not. And so that leads to differentiation. Let's look at how stem cells work in the Drosophila testes. Um, and so stem cells reside in this uh, microenvironment called the hub. And the hub cells here consist of about 12 somatic cells. So these are not germ cells, they're somatic cells. But they're attached to about five to nine germ stem cells. These germ stem cells then that are attached can't go anywhere, right? They're stuck next to these hub cells. And they divide asymmetrically and produce these gonioblast cells while one daughter remains attached to the hub. So these never leave. They just divide and produce gonioblast cells below them. And this forms another uh, uh, stem cell pre or a sperm cell precursor. And as they continue to divide, these precursors get pushed further and further away from the hub and will then develop into mature sperm. So how does this division work? Well, the hub cells, those somatic cells, are attached to the germ cells with these cadherin molecules right at the top here. And what will happen is the hub cells will excrete a paracrine factor to the germ cell that will uh, 
tell the germ cell to through the jack stat pathway that we talked about last lecture to go through the process of cell division now when this happens those centrosomes that are there to uh, pull apart uh, the chromosomes and, and begin the process of uh, cell division one of them will migrate to the cell or to the uh, cytoplasm furthest away from the cell hub while one will stay very near to, uh, in the cortical cytoplasm near the hub and those uh, cohering molecules that are holding it together now when the cell pulls apart the chromosomes get segregated to the, uh, the, the oops, this top side here and this bottom side here and then we get the cleft formation and this beginning of two cells to form the original cell or the daughter cell at the top remains attached with those cohering molecules so it's not going anywhere but the second daughter cell then becomes a gonioblast cell and is able to kind of push further and further away where it will develop into sperm so let's look at how eggs are produced in the ovaries of Drosophila. So similar to the testes, we have these cap cells, which are kind of like the tethers um, in the testes, the hub cells. And attached to them, we have uh, germ stem cells, or uh, GSC. And as these germ stem cells, or GSCs, divide, they produce uh, cystoblasts. Uh, which is indicated in the blue here, that will mature and move further away from the stem cell niche in those cap cells, which will eventually develop into an oocyte surrounded by follicle cells. So similar to uh, the testes, during division of those GSEs, those germ stem cells, one of the daughter cells will remain tethered to the cap cells by those E cohering molecules, and the other will begin the process of uh, differentiation into an egg cell. As these cells move further away from the cap cells, they experience morphogens and other external factors that cause them to differentiate from, uh, into the egg cells. But it's important that those cells that are tethered to the cap, that they remain non-differentiated. And so the way that this happens is that those cap cells um, produce TGF beta ligands. And those TGF beta ligands will bind to the, uh, the GSC cells that were tethered. And they will begin this BMP signal transduction which leads to the suppression of a gene called bag of marbles or BAM and that prevents these cells from differentiating. Now outside of the cells because these are paracrine factors that are being excreted by the cap cells we need to make sure that they don't go too far if they proceed very far away from the cap cells they're, they're going to prevent any of these cells the cysts uh, cells or the cytoblast or cystoblasts from actually becoming eggs. So what happens is these extracellular ma uh, matrix components such as uh, collagen and HSPG, they prevent these TGF beta ligands from going further than that first cell. So they stop this diffusion from proceeding too far away. Now, as this cell uh, divides and proceeds away from the cap cells, it will experience those, it will, first of all, it will be further away from TGF beta, which prevents differentiation, and it will experience a new microenvironment that will allow it to differentiate uh, via this BAM uh, transcription to differentiate into an oocyte. So we're going to talk a little bit here about the ventricular sub, uh, ventricular zone and stem cell uh, generation uh, in uh, neurons. And so this, as you can see from this slide, this could be almost an entire lecture just going over everything in the slide. So we're just going to hit the key components um, that you need to know here. And so um, to orient you, the bottom here is the apical and the top is the basal. So this uh, the E cells down here at the bottom are the uh, ependymal cells, and so they're on the outside, right? Um, and they're kind of along the ventricular wall. And from there, um, moving inwards, 
we have these uh, neural stem cells that are called B cells. So we have three of them uh, depicted here. From there, those neur neural stem cells create progenitor C cells. So as they divide, they will create these green or kind of sea foam green progenitor cells, which will differentiate further into uh, through the process of neurogenesis and become these A cells, which will then migrate to wherever they're needed to become uh, to you know fill in your neurons. Um, so you know you've heard you may have at least this was the case when I was a child uh, that you know don't do all these things to uh, affect your brain cells. You're going to lose brain cells and you know they don't get replaced. Well, now we further evidence and, and science has revealed that there is um, stem cells that exist in neural tissue and in the brain that will um, fill in for uh, damaged or deceased uh, neural cells. And so this is part of that process. Uh, also, I want to note here that these B cells that are that give rise to the um, neuroblast cells through neurogenesis that go and, and proceed elsewhere in the neural tissue, they have kind of three states. And so we have these two states here, uh, B2 and B3 on the right hand side. Those are actively proliferating neural stem cells. So they are actually actively creating these C cells, which will then be differentiate in, through neurogenesis and become neurons. Um, and then we have this B1 state, which is an inactive state of that stem cell. So um, we're going to leave it at that for this slide. Um, there's so much more going on here with GABA and Sonic Hedgehog, Notch, etc. cetera. Um, but like I said, this can be a whole lecture. So the primary, take, uh, primary takeaway I want you to take from this slide is that neural stem cells exist. Um, they we have these four different layers where stem cells become C cells and then differentiate into A cells and then get trafficked away. Um, and that's about it for this. So we're just, we're learning a lot about these neural stem cells uh, currently in science. As I said, when I was younger, there was the idea that if you lose brain cells, they never get replaced and you just become dumber over time. Well, um, What's interesting is there is obviously neural uh, degradation over time, right? You know, you get older and you don't remember as many things, etc. And so um, these, this um, ventricular subventricular zone has this interesting characteristic, and that is that there is this pinwheel rosette, as they say. Um, as you can see here, it's kind of a donut shape. Um, that is maintained in this, this cell zone. And it's maintained in part by this adhesion molecule called VCAM1. Um, let's see if I can, VCAM, sorry for my terrible mouse-driven writing, um, but VCAM1 are, is depicted as the red here, um, and it co-localizes um, with this these B cells in the pinwheel core as well, so in the center here. Um, the, the blue is the, the beta, uh, or beta catenin, which is localized on the outside of the cells here, as you can see, that kind of depicts the outer edge of this pinwheel rosette. And as the brain ages, the number of pinwheels and the number of stem cells um, in those pinwheels it decreases. And so this decrease is then correlated, we can correlate that with reduced neural potency. So the ability for these um, uh, neural cells and pinwheels to function over time decreases. And so it's not so much as I was told when you're little that uh, you lose brain cells and they're never replaced, but we do see this effect of aging on these, neurals, um, these neural pinwheels um, that when they break down and as they start to lose their structure and the amount of stem cells within, that you see a reduction in the potency or the efficacy of these neural cells. So there's something to be said that 
um, while cells are replaced, there still is neural uh, degradation over time as you age. So showing the role of that VCAM1 in these pinwheel formations, uh, in this experiment here, they used an antibody that blocks VCAM1. And as you can see, if you block VCAM1, what happens is those pinwheels are no longer formed. And this structure is important for the potency of these, this neural structure and these neural cells. And so removal of that is detrimental. And so it's likely that over time, as you age, your v, the amount of VCAM1 uh, that is being expressed in your, your neural cells is reduced, and that's what's leading to this reduction in pinwheel formation and subsequent uh, neural degradation. Interestingly, it seems that there's something in the blood that can influence this neurogenesis in these neural stem cells in the brain. And so if you remember from two slides ago, that slide that I said could be its entire lecture, um, well, if you look at those stem cells, you'll see that they have kind of this process that proceeds all the way and it attaches to the vasculature. And so at that point, um, it can accept things over the blood uh, brain barrier from the blood to those neural stem cells. And it's easier to pass through there to get into contact with those uh, neural stem cells. And so in this experiment, what they did is they picked an isochronic pair of mice. So they took two old mice and they linked their uh, cir uh, circulatory systems together. So uh, kind of in a Frankenstein experiment, they took tubing and hooked up the, uh, they had the same blood type and hooked up their blood delivery systems together. And then in their experimental group, they had a heterochronic pair. So they had an old mouse and a young mouse, as opposed to two old mice. And what they found is that the number of these neural pro uh, progenitor cells, if you have an old mouse and an old mouse, they're quite low. And that's to be expected as you age, the your neural stem cells don't work as well. They're not not as many as produced. However, in the old mouse, if it was hooked up to the circulatory system of a young mouse, they saw that they kind of reactivated the neural stem cells in the brain and were able to produce more neural progenitor cells uh, in that mouse. Um, this GFP standing down at the bottom here is kind of showing the vasculature uh, and the increased um, kind of rejuvenation of the vascular structure within the mouse. I love this figure because they have this young mouse who's unfortunately paired up to an old mouse looking all happy and you can see all these blood vessels <laughs> that are that are attached uh, attaching the two. Uh, kind of a very lighthearted way to put kind of a, a somewhat gruesome experiment. From that experiment, what they were able to find was kind of whittle down the uh, blood-borne signaling factors and found that this GDF11 was the signaling factor that is responsible for this uh, rejuvenation of the neural stem cells into active proliferation. And so instead of uh, linking two mice together via vasculature, what they could do is they could take old mice and they could inject them with ample amounts or increased amounts of this GDF11 plus and see that it caused an increase in the vasculature that we saw when those two mice were, the old mouse and the young mouse were linked together, as well as an increase in the number of neuroprogenitor cells. And so this can be um, uh, quantified here, as we see in our bar plot, and it's significantly different where administering GDF11 leads to the increase in neural progenitors and the rejuvenation of those neural stem cells. So now we're going to look at another type of stem cells, intestinal stem cells, and its regulation. So the intestinal epithelium is composed of these long finger-like villi that project into the lumen or the inside of the intestine. And at the base of them is, are these deep pits that we call crypt. Um, and at the very top, we have the villus. Um, 
the, uh, the progenitor cells, uh, the stem cells, reside at the very bottom of the crypts, and cell death occurs at the top uh, via uh, anoicus. And what that is, is the cells kind of being squeezed out, they, they get like shed off into the lumen. Um, and so turnover of these cells uh, within the, the intestinal lumen happens every you know two to three days, so they're pretty short-lived cells. And so along the uh, proximal distal axis, so from the crypt uh, all the way up to the uh, villi, uh, this region can be divided into kind of three regions. And so the base of the crypt houses the stem cells. So that's this red region again. And you can see it in more detail over on the right hand side here. And the proliferation zone or pro <laughs> proliferative zone, excuse me, is made up of transit amplifying cells. So they're starting that differentiation process here. And then we have the differentiation zone where they finally become intestinal cells and uh, mature epithelial cells. And so uh, the around the um, these crypts are uh, pericryptal stromal cells. And what they do is secrete morphogen gradients of uh, WNTB or WNT2B, excuse me, and BMP4. And as you can see, these gradients, like we talked about throughout this entire class, uh, development is the story of gradients, right? And so you can see that if you are down at the very base of the crypt, you have a lot of this WNT2B and you have very little BMP4. And then as you proceed up to the differentiation zone, those ratios are flipped where you have very small amounts of WNT2B and you have quite a bit of BMP4. Now, the amount of these factors play a role in what you differentiate into. And so if you have a lot of WNT2B, you tend to stay a, um, a stem cell. If, and if you have a lot of BMP4 and little WNT2B, then you differentiate into an intestinal epithelial cell. So if we look closer at the base of one of these crypts, you can see that there's a higher concentration of WNT2B down at the bottom here, and a high concentration of w, or a BMP4 up at the top here. So those were those two gradients working in opposite directions. Now, as the stem cells divide, they originally maintain their stem cellness. Uh, they divide and they become stem cells again. However, as more and more of these cells divide in this area here, what they do is they push these cells further up the villi, further up the crypt, towards the top of those villi. And as that happens, their microenvironment or their niche is changing. And so eventually they're gonna to get to a point where they experience much more of this BMP4. They're no longer in the bottom of that crypt and they're moving up and that BMP4 tells them, okay, it's time to start differentiating. Now, once they get all the way to the top, at a certain time point, they run out of room, right? Because those two peaks, let me do it towards the camera, <laughs> are coming together and they're gonna squeeze out kind of at the top and that's when the uh, anoicus uh, happens, and that's a cell death that is the result or results from loss of attachment. And so they kind of get squeezed out of the picture, and new ones come to take their place until they're squeezed out of the picture. And it's just a never-ending cycle of replenishing uh, this intestinal epithelium. So here we can see a actual uh, histology. We can see some staining of these intestinal villi, and in the first part here, you can see that they stain. Um, my red marker is probably not the best for this. <laughs> they uh, stained the cells that are in the crypt, and as they or through cell divisions, they get pushed further and further up the edge of the villi until they reach the top. And once they reach the top, that an anoicus happens, and they're squeezed out, and they are no longer part of the epithelium. They're excreted through uh, natural human defecation. So now we're going to talk a little bit about mesenchymal stem cells. Um, these are cells that morphologically resemble fibroblasts. 
um, so they don't really look like stem cells. However, in culture, they can solve for new and produce uh, clonal populations of cells uh, that can differentiate into different organ types. Mesenchymal stem cells are able to differentiate into multiple different types of cells, and they have a very interesting environmental sensing ability that helps them to do this. And this is by sensing the elasticity of the environment around them. So if you're to take mesenchymal stem cells and were to place them, culture them on a media uh, that is similar elasticity to brain tissue, what happens is you end up with the expression of genes that will differentiate those cells into brain tissue. Now, if you're to change the elasticity to something more similar to that of muscle tissue, you start to see the expression of genes in these mesenchymal cells for muscle production. So uh, myOD, for example. Then if you were to increase that, uh, that toughness of the extracellular matrix and make it more similar to that of bone tissue, you start to see the uh, osteogenic genes that would differentiate the tissue into uh, the mesenchymal stem cells into bone tissue start to be expressed. And so this gives a lot of uh, flexibility to mesenchymal stem cells to differentiate into different types of uh, tissues based on where they are located. And so um, it's found that this differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells um, can be abolished by treating them with blebastatin, which is a uh, chemical that inhibits microfilament assembly within the cell membrane. So that microfilament that, you know, uh, actin cytoskeleton inside the cell is where that message is relayed from the elasticity of the extracellular matrix through a cascade to change uh, gene expression within the nucleus and then hence uh, differentiation down the line. So when we talk about culturing stem cells, um, there we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but there are really two major sources of pluripotent stem cells uh, from an early embryo. And one is embryonic stem cells that arise from culturing that uh, inner cell mass, um, that ICM that we talked about earlier, uh, that is indicated here on this blastocyst. Um, and these are cells that are not yet differentiated, um, but you can also culture embryonic germ cells, uh, or EG cells for short. And these are uh, gonad cells that are not uh, differentiated yet, so they're still pluripotent, and they have not migrated yet to the gonads. And so um, we'll get in the future uh, into a little bit of how these gonad uh, cells uh, migrate to their, what results in the ovaries or the testes, um, but they can be extracted and cultured as well. So the holy grail of stem cells really is being able to take stem cells, grow them in culture, and then make them into a tissue that you need for to grow an organ or a tissue graft or things like that. And so we're starting to kind of put this map together of how to take uh, embryonic stem cells over here on the left and differentiate those into uh, whatever tissue type we're looking at. And so embryonic stem cells can be differentiated into epiblast cells. And then from there, depending if we use BMP4, WNT, and Activin, we can coax those cells to become ectoderm, which then with BMP4 or FGF can become skin or neural cells. Or from the epiblast, uh, we can use WNT and Activin to create cells that would be present in the posterior primitive, stre uh, primitive streak. We'll get more into that uh, in the coming lectures. Um, but these cells are then progenitors uh, where we can make uh, hematopoietic cells, vascular cells, cardiomyocytes, hepatocytes, all sorts of different things just by changing the transcription or paracrine factors that they're expressed to. So building this map and knowing exactly how we can coax these cells along to culture full tissues is kind of that holy grail of um, stem cell research and the ability to 
create tissues from these cultures. Another thing we can do with uh, culturing stem cells is study diseases that are hard to model in animals um, and hard to study in human patients. Um, and an example of this would be cystic fibrosis. Um, and what we can do is we can induce those pluripotent stem cells from a cystic fibrosis sufferer and then study those cultured cells in the lab. So here we have uh, the um, induced pluripotent stem cells that's becoming a tissue. Um, and we have stain for uh, NXK2, um, which is, oops, sorry, that's the red one. Um, and that is the lung epithelium, so the inside of your lungs. Um, the tubulin of the epithelial cells, um, which is disrupted in uh, cystic fibrosis, is what's steamed green here. So you can see it's kind of got chunks missing and it's a little bit uh, deformed. Um, and then nuclei are stained with DAPI and they're stained blue. And so this gives us an ability to um, look at how cystic fibrosis works at a molecular level without needing to take tissue from a patient because obviously if they're suffering from cystic fibrosis that they, they can't give away tissue, they, they need that for <laughs> survival. Um, and some of these uh, diseases that we want to study aren't able to be modeled or there's no real analog um, in a rodent or different model. And so this is a technique that allows us to kind of study some of these um, aspects of the disease without being invasive. So while it's still in its infancy, we're able to uh, kind of devise strategies for how to cure gene or how to cure diseases using these embryonic stem cells. So in this example here, uh, what they're looking to do is cure sickle cell anemia in a mouse uh, who has been genetically altered to have human, a human version of sickle cell anemia. And so what they do is first is extract uh, those uh, fibroblasts from the mouse whose genome contains the alleles for the sickle cell anemia, so this transgenic mouse and they culture those cells and proliferate them, so make a whole bunch of them. But then they infect them with these four genes, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and C-MIC. Um, they infect it using a virus to get them into the cells. And by doing this, they turn those fibroblast cells pluripotent. So they're now able to become any type of cell tissue. From there, they select those pluripotent cells based on what they look like. So are they no longer fibroblast shaped and do they look like pluripotent stem cells? And using molecular technologies, now you hear about CRISPR all the time and some of these other transgenic technologies, they're able to go in and replace or fix that mutation in that um, uh, sickle cell anemia gene. And so in this cell culture now, we have fixed mice cells. Now we can take those fixed mice cells and culture them, and they create uh, these embryoid bodies. And within these embryoid bodies, or this, these amounts of tissue that we've cultured, um, are these blood-forming stem cells. And these uh, uh, hematopoietic uh, progenitor stem cells um, are then injected back into the original mouse, who hopefully those stem cells will start to create blood cells that are not uh, sickle cell and will kind of provide a therapy or a replacement for this, uh, these broken genes and allow for um, kind of supplementation and allowing proper uh, blood cells to be um, created.